Hi, Shayla, am I in the meeting? Good morning, Dr. Mattis. Yeah, you are in the meeting. Okay, oh yeah, I gotta turn up my volume. Great. Hey, thanks, how are you? <laughs> Doing good, how are you? Fine, thanks. Good. Okay, I got the volume up, perfect. I just wanna make sure that it works. <laughs> yes, sir, yep, we can hear you. Great. How many are registered, do we know? We have 78 registered. Wow, okay. I imagine these Zoom meetings, there's always a last minute sort of assignment. <laughs> Should I, I'll, uh, Shayla, I'll mute myself. And uh, Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> in the Eastern time zone. Good, good morning in the Central time zone. How are you? Hey, Joe Newton here. Joe Newton, hi, Mike Cutner. Hi, yeah. Jim Mattis. Hi, Jim Mattis. Oh, yeah. Hey, good, good seeing you, Mike. Good, good seeing you. you. Good seeing you guys. Having a great time just staying at home and working from home and all that kind of stuff. Best way to do it. Yep. Dr. Kuttner, I made you... Um, I made you a co-host in case you want to share your screen. If you have any slides that you want to present while you're speaking, I didn't know if you did, but the no, I, don't, I don't have any slides. I'm just going to talk off the cuff. Okay. okay. Sounds Thank good. You, though. All right. Can you hear me? This is Bill Smith. Yes, I can hear you. No, we can't hear you, Bill Smith. Oh, I can see you. <laughs> That's all that matters. So. Hey, Bill. How are you doing? Joe. Hello, here. Angie. Hi, Pop. <laughs> okay. Howdy, Bill. Howdy, Bill. Hi, Jim. Hi, Joe. I wanted to hear some other people's ho stories. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you, dear. <laughs> I will mute. And hello, Elaine. I forgot to speak to you. Hello. How are you?
We're okay, and I have the missus here to talk to you when you get bored, okay? Oh, awesome. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Johnson. Hello, Shayla. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. <laughs> Great. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Good. This Zoom makes it feel like we're a little farther away than we actually are. I know. It's kind of strange. Dr. Vidikovich and I earlier were doing a little test run, and he's just around the corner, but it feels like we're further away. Yeah. Right. Shayla, I don't seem to have my picture on it. Is there a problem with me or you? Um, is let me see. Can you share your screen? Are you do you have the capability to share your screen? Or not uh, share yes. your screen, yes, but um, start your video? Yeah, I can share screen. You want me to hit that? Maybe not share screen, just start your video. Sorry, I, I did the wrong thing. Oh, okay. Start my video. Hello there, oh, everyone. There you go. There you oh, go. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Hi. Absolutely. Hi, Baylor. Hi, Mike. Hey, hey Bronnie. How you doing? Very good, good. Mike. How are you? Good. Very good. I see yeah. Val on here, too. Hi, Val. Hi, Mike. Good morning, Erson. Uh-oh. He's muted. Where's Erson? Where's Erson? Uh, Erson, you're muted. Okay. I look like I am in Hawaii. Oh, yes. hey. <laughs> it's in the background because um, um, this room is my staging area for cleaning the food coming from outside. So, <laughs> so like, I first sanitize everything, then I really go in, then I take them in. So what I did is the, I had a choice. Either come up with a curtain or come up with the background by mistake, I came up with the, you know, the Hawaii, but I'm not <laughs> able to get rid of it now, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's oh. 12 o'clock. Do we want to get started, Dr. Vitakovich? Well, uh, we have 50 people uh, already, so I guess we, we can start. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. It is definitely an honor to have you all here celebrating um, Dr. Hartley's legacy. I know that everyone um, is having a, a nice time. It's kind of like a reunion in the um, climate that we're in today. But um, I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce Dr. Val Johnson. He is the Dean of the College of Science. He's going to get us started um, on the celebration. Well, thanks, Shayla, and, and howdy to everyone. Uh, so it is, it is great to be here today. Uh, howdy. Yeah, howdy. Uh, it's, it's a shame we couldn't hold this event in person, but uh, I'm, I'm really happy that the Department of Statistics is finally able to honor its founder, Professor Hartley, with an endowed chair. So to get started, I would like to thank uh, Urson Arsevin, Bill Smith, and Tom Powell especially for making today's celebration possible. As many of you know, uh, Urson has been working to instill this honor on Professor Hartley for some time. And with Bill and Tom's support, this goal has now been achieved. Uh, we have uh, quite a few people here today, and I'm really happy to see that. And I think a, a number of people are going to speak about Professor Hartley's legacy and statistics. But I uh, would like to begin by saying a few words about Dr. Ronnie Vitakovic. Uh, the inaugural recipient of the uh, Hartley Chair in Statistics. So let me provide some background on Bronnie's career. So I guess as everybody knows, Bronnie joined Texas a and this August after completing a two-year appointment as a rotating program officer at the National Science Foundation in the Division of Mathematical Sciences. Uh, Bronnie was serving at the NSF while on leave from Georgia Tech, 
where he had a joint appointment in the School of Industrial and System Engineering and the Department of Biomedical Engineering. So prior to moving to Georgia Tech in 2000, uh, Bronnie was an assistant and then an associate professor of statistics and decision sciences at the Institute of Statistics and Decision Sciences at Duke University. Uh, I think that organization has changed its name since then, but uh, it was better known as ISDS back in the day. And uh, Bronnie was there uh, with me, I might mention, from 1992 uh, to 2000. Uh, before beginning his career at Duke, Bronnie received uh, a bachelor's and master's in mathematics from Belgrade University in Serbia, where he then worked as an assistant in mathematics and statistics from 1979 to 1987. He then moved to Purdue University, where he received his PhD in 1992. Uh, during the course of his career, Bronnie has authored uh, amazingly 10 books. Uh, 16 book chapters, more than 100 peer-reviewed articles, and he supervised more than 20 PhD students. And as I think, as most of you know, Bronnie is very widely recognized for his research in statistical mod modeling and wavelet domains, and has applied that methodology in two major areas of application, the geosciences and bioinformatics and health. Uh, Bronnie has received numerous awards and has served on a variety of editorial boards during his career, including, including being named a fellow of the ASA, an elected member of ISI, editor-in-chief of Wiley's uh, second edition of the Encyclopedia of Statistical Sciences, and he served as an advisor to the CDC Dental Health Group. But most importantly to all of us, of course, he's agreed to serve as the head of our Department of Statistics. And it's just been great getting Bronnie uh, to College Station to do that. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce him as the inaugural holder of the Herman Otto Hartley Chair in Statistics. So congratulations, Bronnie, if you'd like to say, say a few things. Uh, thank you. Thank you all very much. And I am really pleased to to come to College Station and to Texas A&M, to the great school that I always had big admiration. But today is more about H.O. Uh, Hartley, the founder of the statistics uh, department here. And I prepared a small tribute, actually, uh, that I essentially found uh, coming here. Uh, Dr. Hartley is known for uh, his test and for his tables. But when I came here at, uh, in Texas, in uh, Texas A&M, I realized that this great man uh, contributed a lot more. And this is not known to every statistician. And we are here to fix that. We are here to uh, maybe work on more visibility of Dr. Hartley's work. Legacy. So let me share my uh, slides. Can you see those? Yes, okay. So more visibility for uh, H.O. Hartley's legacy. And I reiterate what Val mentioned, a big thanks to Ersen Arseven. He did his PhD under uh, H.O. Hartley in the critical path analysis. Very, very interesting uh, graph theory application. And William B. Smith, who did a thesis, he is essentially an uh, academic grandson of Dr. Hartley, and uh, did his thesis with Dr. Hawking on something which is very close to EM algorithm uh, today. I will mention that. And thank you for Thomas Powell for contributing to this chair uh, position as well. This uh, handsome gentleman uh, is H.O. Uh, Hartley, Professor Hartley. He is in the statistical community uh, very well known for two things. Uh, Christoph Hartley biometrical uh, statistical tables and Hartley's test. However, I realized that he is founder and put seminal work in much, much more notions critical today in statistics. And I will just sample a little bit to, to give you some feeling uh, what he did uh, in, in his work. In about, about 40 years of his, of his work, he uh, published about more than 100 publications, 
all in good journals, excellent journals, and many of these publications are groundbreaking, seminal. His research interests are broad, uh, starting with computation approximation, and then uh, those findings, stochastical compartmental methods, missing data, inference, the list goes on. And some of these uh, research interests really led to new, new research and new branches of statistics. So how to increase visibility of Dr. Hartley? Well, we may like Wikipedia or not like, but uh, there is uh, no doubt that this uh, Wikipedia is influential and that entries there are read by many people. So it is important that uh, whatever is given there is given fair balanced uh, view. And I believe that uh, we have opportunity to increase visibility of Dr. Hartley uh, via Wikipedia and to, access, uh, to, to make access to pretty much everybody interested in statistics. I will start with biometrical tables. This is something amazing and Dr. Hartley is most known for his work on biometrical statistical tables. The tables were obsolete before the Second World War and there was a decision by Egon Pearson, son of Carl Pearson and Hartley to work on new uh, edition of tables. The war prevented them to do this uh, in 1940s but during the war, Dr. Hartley was part of the scientific computing services in London, working on computations uh, in, the, uh, on the, in the context of war at the, at the time, but definitely this expertise was reflected later in, in the uh, construction of statistical tables. The first volume appeared in 54, the second volume in 72, these are fundamental uh, two volumes, not only tables themselves that, that could be used in, as cut points for testing uh, statistical hypotheses, but also the introductions to the tables that in first volume have more than 100 pages, in second volume almost 150 pages, how to use tables and the theory behind the tables. And with uh, Joseph Greenwood in 61, uh, Dr. Hartley, wrote guide to, to this mathematical, to tables of mathematical statistics, more than 1,000 pages. Uh, H. A. David said, this is staggering amount of work, much illuminating advice. So the influence of tables is tremendous. From 1954 to 2000, in about 50 years, the tables were used by thousands of students, statistical researchers, professionals in industry, in government, in science. And not only for essentially testing and applying them, but the, uh, Fisher was stating that tables provided illumination in some theoretical things connected with the Behrens problem of testing the quality of the means when variances, variances are not known. And that was actually um, clarified by looking at uh, Hartley, Pearson Hartley tables. So, in conclusion, about tables, biometrical tables do not have an uh, entry, and they do deserve very nice uh, Wikipedia entry, and this is something to be done. Big other area is in survey sampling. Uh, it starts in immediately after the war. There is something called Paulitz Simons estimator, and that is fixing a bias if you have non response in sampling. And Hartley was proposing blueprint how to do this and how to deal with uh, responses not at home. But then uh, in 1949, three years later, Paulitz and Simons uh, published a paper. And in footnote, they wrote that it was recently brought to their attention that somewhat similar plan was proposed independently by H. O. Hartley before G. Uh, Journal Royal of, uh, of Statistical Society. Well, uh, the, the plan was the same. Uh, the only thing that uh, Hartley was using uh, Monday to Friday and the Paulitz and Simons used the uh, Monday to Saturday as the question 
where are you at home? And somewhat similar uh, is, is really um, long, long. Uh, the, the, the other thing is uh, proposed independently. Well, um, it was proposed earlier. So maybe an entry of Paulin Simon's estimator is due and with credit uh, to Hartley, with due credit to, to Hartley. In survey sampling, uh, also the Hartley Ross estimator. This estimator is to estimate the mean of population of finance size with help of known mean of correlated variable. And that uh, fairly short paper in Nature in 1954 led to uh, explosion of research on ratio type estimation, generalized HR estimation, and so on and so forth. No Wikipedia entry yet. It deserves very strong Wikipedia entry. The Rao Hartley uh, and Cochran uh, scheme in 1962 is also very influential and used. And research uh, involving that scheme is current even today, many years after. It improves on the popular Horvitz-Thompson estimation, estimator, which is also unbiased, but for which variance could be all over the place, even negative. So no Wikipedia entry yet, and this is a nice example of what could be put in, in Wikipedia. But the crux of uh, the, the things is EM algorithm. And this is something that I felt a little bit uh, sad because the uh, legacy is there and the credit is not there. Hartley in uh, 1958 wrote, uh, a paper in biometrics where he essentially used EM algorithm on discrete distributions. And it was followed by Hartley and Rao in 67. Dr. William Smith uh, put something in dissertation in 67 and then Hartley and Hawking in 71. The many years later, several years later, Dempster, Laird and Drupin wrote a review paper, a discussion paper and they changed the name, they gave the name EM algorithm. The only uh, the scans, uh, scan uh, reference to Hartley and, and his team is that Dr. Hartley gave an example, multinomial example, similar to illustrative example. Well, uh, it was much more, and Dr. Hartley in a nice and uh, gentlemanly way pointed out that this is not only multinomial example, that his 1958 paper is dealing with all discrete distributions. And he also pointed out that his uh, 71 paper with uh, Hawking is generalizing uh, EM algorithm to all these uh, continuous distributions and even uh, have theorems which are more general than DLR paper in 1977. The rejoinder, uh, the author said that they thank to Professor Hartley, who is originator of many of the ideas reviewed in their paper. They say that they think that they brought the techniques in better focus, clarified mathematics, and shown that range of important examples is greater than it was previously thought. However, the DLR is cited 62,000 times, and the extensive Wikipedia entry has 37 references, but has no mentioning of Dr. Hartley or his co-authors. And the plan is simply to suggest an editing, an addition, to give credits to Dr. Hartley and, and collaborators of this, of this entry. There are some nice examples. Uh, one is, uh, contribution of Dr. Hartley to tests of equality of variances. And he started essentially by improving on the uh, cut points and Bartlett's test in 1940s. But his namesake test, Hartley's test, is essentially Hartley's F-max test, in which he take the ratio, maximal ratio of two variances in the groups. And at the time, that was really big saving because in 1950s, uh, computation was difficult. So it was uh, in the class of quick 
statistical procedures. And Wikipedia entry gives very nice credit to Dr. Hartley. Later, he, uh, he also uh, did contribute to the non-parametrics and robustness by using studentized range instead of variances and range of ranges for testing the variances. Another example when he got good credit, and this is really nice, is in correspondence analysis. Correspondence analysis is technique which is similar to principal components, but the data are not numerical, they're categorical. And in 1835, with his old German last name, Hirschfeld, Hirschfeld, he wrote a paper on connection between correlation and contingency, which is essentially blueprint and foundational paper for the correspondence analysis. And the entry in Wikipedia gives full credit to Dr. Hartley about that. So how the, uh, his own entry looks like. Uh, there is one uh, sort of stub, one paragraph, and it says, this article about a statistician from the United States is a stub. You can help Wikipedia by expanding it. And that's what we are going to do. We are going to make a big comprehensive entry with all these points that I mentioned and much more because I am going to be in connection with his students and with his collaborators to get some more uh, entries that deserve to be recognized. So in conclusion, this uh, Hartley chair uh, it comes with obligations and one of the obligations is to celebrate and make his legacy more prominent and uh, the, the, uh, the way it deserves. He would be pleased uh, to see how the funds would be used. The funds would be used uh, to support graduate students and postdocs at Texas a and University. So it is going to contribute to the school, to education, to the department. And I would like to thank the College of Science leadership, Duval and his team, and special thanks for Shana Hutchins, who personally got involved and in, in some of the editing things, and she will be great to help with, with, uh, with making these entries to see light of the day. So what is next? Uh, we have here um, Dr. Hartley's students, colleagues, and uh, Dr. Ersen Arseven, William Smith, Jim Mattis, John Rao, and Mike Kutner will say a few words about, about Dr. Hartley and their, their reflections and their remembrances. And at the end, uh, we have a very special speaker, uh, Jennifer Mollett, daughter of Dr. Hartley. If she is in, yes, she is, I see. She will say a few words. So I will uh, ask Ersen to, to say a few words about his advisor. I really come across the Hartley name when I was at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Michael Hartley was a couple years ahead of me. And uh, you know, I really didn't know who Hartley was. And, <clears throat> But I was assigned, uh, you know, I had to write a paper and it was a nonlinear estimation. So I ended up finding an article, a couple articles from, you know, the Hartley. Uh, I didn't know that I was going to end up in the college station and then the first in economics, then, you know, to go to the statistics, you know, the department. So I came to Texas A&M economics, then I moved to the uh, statistics. I think Hartley is a very special, you know, the person, you know, the, to me. And uh, I got emotional. I felt like he and his wife uh, was like our grandparents. And he was an extremely sharp person. And he had accomplished immensely. And somehow, you know, the, he was not aggressive enough, that's the word that I'm going to use, that his work is really kind of taken away and given name by other people. So I just want to share one of my experience with him. Um, 
since he brought the TIMIS, you know, the funds to the college, uh, Texas A&M University, and um, uh, I was his assistant, and I was going to write my dissertation on a subject matter that the funded by the, you know, the TIMIS uh, project. And Hartley always considered you his colleague. That was really very dangerous when you are a graduate student, because uh, then he assumed that you understand everything, you know, that he tells you. So we had a couple of meetings in his office, and uh, it was supposed to be 15, 20 minutes to decide the topics, and then it would end up with a couple of hours. Uh, eventually, I was assigned, uh, you know, the subject matter, and uh, I was working on the project. One of the things that I have really noticed is that the, he was working on so many projects that when he is really discussing your problem, he is looking at that problem within the framework of what he is working on. So what would happen is that uh, I would go, you know, the first time and uh, I start talking about what I have accomplished. You know, we would meet about initially first every three weeks. So, but he would interfere and he would start talking about things that uh, I didn't think that it was in my subject matter. So I said, oh, okay, I must have misunderstood. I would go and start working on it and I would come back three weeks later. And again, you know, the, I would start talking about and the, uh, he would kind of puzzled and the, he would start modifying what I was discussing. So I said, you know, the, I have to find a solution to this. And I wasn't gonna say that Dr. Hartley, you know, the, this is not what I'm working on. So with a great stupidity, I grabbed my, you know, the cassette tape recorder and the walked into his office next time. So he kind of looked at me, he said, am I gonna be deposed? You know, so, and then he had a little smile kind of, and he realized that I was really serious and, you know, the anxiety laden. So he said, what is the problem? I said, sir, I think that I understood what I was supposed to work, but every time I come over here, you know, that you modify it. So he told me, okay, take a few minutes. He went to his desk and his blackboard was at the end of his big office. And he said, in five minutes, you describe to me clearly and succinctly what is the topic that, what is the project that you are working on? So I did. So he looked at, he said, that's okay. So I said, to prevent any kind of misunderstanding, what we are gonna do is that the, at the end of every discussion session, we are gonna write down what we discuss and what we come to conclusion. So then after, Really, everything went very smoothly, and I was able to finish my dissertation and, uh, you know, the, the, the Texas A&M. As an ending note, I would say, really, wherever I am right now, I owe immensely to him. I cannot even describe how much I owe him. So this is really wonderful that uh, we are going to kind of make the Hartley picture clearer to the professional statisticians in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ersen. And I'm inviting William B. Smith. Bill, uh, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, before I start reminiscing about Professor Hartley, by the way, all his friends knew him as Ho, I don't think I ever called him anything but Dr. Hartley. Uh, but before I start rem reminiscing, I want to thank a and its leaders and the STAT faculty for its wise choice of Professor Bitakovic as the statistics department head, as well as being the first holder of the Hartley chair. He's well deserving of these honors. And moreover, I think that Ho would be incredibly, incredibly pleased with uh, his choice. Secondly, I want to thank Erson, Erson Arsabin, for initiating and in many ways 
uh, leading the creation of the Hartley chair. Without his efforts and the financial commitment he made, I fear that this chair would never have come to fruition. Now, a few remembrances. Uh, mine are not nearly so serious nor uh, statistically oriented. And in fact, they probably are a little apocryphal. So don't hold me for absolute correct correctness in this. The first one I remember is I, I entitled it, uh, Ho was not sensitive about his physical stature. Uh, now, as you know, uh, some of you know, but probably not many of you knew him personally, but physically he was uh, what we would call vertically challenged. He was about five feet tall. And his, his uh, co-worker, Egon Pearson, was uh, six foot five at the very least. So we had a, when we had Egon Pearson here in College Station, it was a typical, I'm gonna use an old phrase now, Mutt and Jeff uh, appearance. One was very sharp, one was very tall. Uh, and uh, so I, I remember that because I entitled this area, uh, this remembrance is, I'm not, he was not sensitive about his physical stature. Uh, as a very young faculty member, I attended an ENAR, Biometric Science, a Biometric Society meeting in Atlanta with, with him and with Ron Hockey. In one of the large uh, sessions, I noticed that he arrived a bit late, about halfway through the, this invited presentation. But during the Q&A period, after the lecture, he joined the line of uh, questioners. And when it was in his turn to pose a question, he went through the following steps. A, he typed, tapped the microphone to the dismay, of course, of the session chair. Then he said, can you hear me? Uh, here being drawn out for emphasis. And then he said, paused and said, can you see me? Surprisingly to me, the entire audience roared with laughter. Apparently, I had just witnessed a technique that he used repeatedly at large meetings. And of course, after the audience calmed down, he asked the most probing question of all for the speaker. So I thought that was very good. Uh, not many of us could get away with that, but he did. The second remembrance is more personal. Uh, it deal, I entitled it Randomization and Their Continental Breakfast. Uh, Grace Hartley, his wife, was planning their annual continental breakfast. Now, this was an event that required all faculty and staff to be there, all students in statistics to be there, and many friends that he knew in Bryan College Station. So uh, she was uh, not satisfied with the way their lawn looked. Uh, it had several what we call brown spots. By the way, that's typical of College Station in the late summer, like now. Uh, and so what she did was go out and buy seeds to replenish the spots. And she asked uh, Dr. Hartley to sow those seeds for her while she was busy doing other things. And a few short weeks later, the seeds flourished, but in only one spot, not on all the brown spots. Apparently he was too busy to get rid of his yellow pad, which he carried with him at all times and wished to return it to his research uh, uh, so that he forgot to randomize amongst the places to put it. Uh, much better for statistic research, but maybe not for domestic tranquility. And by the way, the weather at these uh, continental breakfasts were, that were held during October each year never was bad. Uh, we said that Grace used to walk out on the front yar yard and wave her hand and the sky cleared. I, I don't know whether that was true or not. <laughs> and finally, I want to talk about uh, his graphics. And this is more about me than he, and I get back to him with, at the end of this. But when I was a student, uh, I was enrolled in a biostat course that he was teaching. And as I recall, during the lecture, he illustrated on the chalkboard now, before all the computing that we had, uh, the use of least squares in fitting a particular model. No computers now, not as we know. So he kept referring to the mob deviation several times, and he gave a detailed discussion about their properties. Of course, 
with my being a relatively new graduate student in statistics and only had a mathematics background, I could, took careful notes of everything he said. And after the class, I tried and failed to find the author, presumably Moth, of the name devi deviations. Of course, my wife, who's smarter than I, told me, told her ignorant husband that mauve was a color. Obviously, he was talking about the chalk color he used in the illustration rather than citing an author. So by the way, I went by and later told him of my color slash author confusion. He had a good laugh. And then he gave me one of those famous pep talks. So when you did something a little unusual, he would invite you in to talk about things. He was never abusive or anything. He just discussed how what you did maybe could improve in some way. So I remember him as a teacher, a mentor, a leader, and a friend. He had an incredible intellect. His vision of progress in the statistics were absolutely above board at the time. He had a dedication to both our discipline and to Texas A&M by making it better for his having been here. And truly, I feel like I would not have come here unless he was here. So I came because he was here. Thank you much for your attention. Thank you, Bill, very much. And uh, I'm inviting James Mattis, Jim Mattis, his student. So. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, great. Hey, let me first thank you, Brandy, for organizing this uh, wonderful event. And, and not only for that, but for your research and the whole career and, and for your call, you know, for us to uh, help draw more attention to the legacy that he had. That, that's a wonderful presentation. And, and Bill, I thank you and Urson for, and, and Tom, Tom Powell for funding this uh, chair, which is another way to, to honor Hull and, and perpetuate, you know, the legacy. So uh, my name is uh, Jim Mattis. Uh, I know many of you. I graduated in 1970. Incredibly, you know, that's exactly 50 years ago. <laughs> and that's, that's half a century. And, uh, and yet that's where many of us are. And, uh, but notwithstanding that, I have uh, very vivid memories of, of Ho and, and uh, Grace and, and, and just appreciate this opportunity to share them. So here is, is my copy of, of the Pearson Hardaway Tables. And, uh, and, and, and as you mentioned, uh, Brandy, I used often 103 pages in here that preceded the tables and because there's such a, a wonderful description of, of the theory and, and examples also of the use of those. But I, I treasure this book because it has the name Pearson and, and Bill mentioned uh, uh, Egon Pearson visiting here. And uh, I, I remember one other thing about that visit, Bill. So I stood by Egon Pearson, and as you mentioned, he was taller than I, 6'5". And uh, so it was like a Mutt and Jeff thing, as you said. But somebody made the comment, and I think it was Ho, uh, who said, quote, never were there two more appropriate statisticians to develop the concept of range. <laughs> so so that, there was the, the vivid example of, of uh, in my mind, the tallest and the shortest of statisticians that I knew, uh, and, and who both you know, developed the concept of range. So, uh, you know, Hartley's height has been mentioned and, and, uh, uh, and he called attention to it, as, as you mentioned. So I want to use that to pivot to three correlations that, that Hartley helped me understand. And the first correlation is this, that there's no correlation between the height of the person and the size of his brain, his or her brain. <laughs> and so, and Hartley was, a vivid demonstration of that, as he was perhaps as smart a man as I've ever found. And, and, and let me add just two comments to support that. These are personal things. But was remember, we had those lectures in the, in the Blocker Lecture Hall, and, and that has perhaps 20 rows of seats. And Hartley was always up front. He was in second or third row. And he had a policy that was, he would always, always ask the speaker some question. Uh, regardless of, of the topic, because that actually, you know, is a compliment uh, to the speaker and, and starts the discussion. So I knew that he'd ask a question every time. But the surprising thing to me was that often he was on the second or third row 
and I can see him nodding off a bit. <laughs> it seemed to me that, that he missed part of the presentation. And yet, to my surprise, always he asked a question that was spot on. And I, I didn't know how he could possibly do that other than just recreating in his mind, you know, everything that he'd gone through and, and drawn his broad statistical experience and asking just the perfect question. That was always amazing to me. And the other thing that, that uh, personal to me is that uh, I came uh, to a and from Brigham Young where I'd worked on a field called Department of uh, Compartmental Analysis. And when I got to a and I took two courses that were very, very important to me. And one was called Stochastic Processes taught by John Rowell. And it used a Manny Parsons book. Remember that? That, that was what a small world. And the other one, Bill, you taught the applications of stochastic processes. And, and as I learned both those principles, it occurred to me that perhaps I could incorporate those into compartmental analysis. And when it came time to visit uh, about forming a committee, I visited with, with Ho, and uh, we talked about this. And, and even though I don't think that Ho had done much in stochastic processes, and for sure, he had no previous experience with compartmental analysis, he was enthusiastic about that. And he encouraged me to pursue that. And, and, and he grasped that very quickly and always had relevant uh, guidance to me on that. So what, what an incredible experience that was for him to, to adopt that whole new field and, and, um, and, and, and help me uh, in, that, in that quest. So all these things taught me that there's no correlation between a person's height and the size of his or her brain. But there, there's a second correlation also, and that is there's no correlation between the size of, a person, of the person's height and the size of his or her heart. Because Ho is this kind of man also, as I've ever found, as, as some of you mentioned. And, and Bill, I want to read uh, just a part of, of the obituary that, that you wrote. And it says this, Ho was deeply concerned with people as individuals. He and his wife knew when babies were born when parents were ill, and when there, was, when there was financial strains on students or faculty. And, and I'm a witness of this. And I remember Ho coming to our home after the birth of our son, and, and he and Grace were there and uh, visited with us. And I always uh, had interest in, in our family as he did all the other families. And, and I need to add one other thing to that. His kindness was well known. But I want to add that in my experience also, he was especially kind to foreign students. And perhaps that was because he, they had a greater need, but he was always there. And, and, and Jennifer, um, I, perhaps his compassion for foreign students came from the fact that he himself once was an immigrant. But anyway, that, that contributed to the very kindness he has. He was, uh, as somebody mentioned, like a grandfather or a surrogate father, or a surrogate mother at weddings and the social occasions and whenever there was a need. And as Bill mentioned, he always had that pep talk, you know, when they to help people. So all of this suggests to me and tell me that uh, there's and always an example of this, that there's no positive correlation between a person's height and the size of his or her heart. And, and I want to add a, a third suggestion or some correlation, <laughs> and that is there's no correlation between a person's height and his enthusiasm for becoming an adopted Texan. And, and uh, let me add that uh, as I took a look at Ho's life, uh, it, it turned out that Ho and Grace were married in England where they lived for 13 years. And then they came to Iowa and they lived there for 10 years. But they came to Texas. I suppose that in, in, uh, in England and Iowa, it's very difficult to obtain land. But here it was in Texas where there was quote, wide open spaces. <laughs> and, and they had the enthusiasm to become a Texan. And within five years, they had uh, found land in a, a little place called Snook, Texas, which is only 20 miles from College Station. But there they acquired 100 acres, which uh, they called the Hartley Ranch. And it was uh, just a virgin, uncleared land, but they started to develop that. And, and you know, this is, uh, although this is virgin, uh, uncleared land, it had essentials that one would have in a ranch. It had a small cabin, it had abundant deer, it has a little pond with fish, and it had cattle that uh, a neighbor used uh, for grazing. 
So we had all the things that would make a real country Texan. <laughs> and Hall and Grace developed that uh, for the 10 years uh, that they were here. So that's my final correlation. No, no positive correlation between a person's height and his or her enthusiasm for becoming adopted Texan. So uh, I'm, I'm proud that, that uh, Ho was uh, guided me on a dissertation. I'm proud that uh, uh, I can call him my academic father. Uh, he was my boss and uh, also an exemplar through the Hartley Award. Uh, and, um, and, and I, I really reiterate that he was as smart, as a kind of man as I've ever found. And, and I'm grateful for this opportunity that we have to, to uh, draw attention to his research and uh, go through Wikipedia to uh, even expand and perpetuate his legacy. Hey, thanks so much. This is really fun for me and, and I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much, it's very nice. Thank you. Now we have uh, somebody from Canada joining. Is uh, John Rao here with us? If not, maybe there is some difficulty. Let's go to our next speaker. And next speaker would be, would be Mike Kutner, joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, thank you, Brownie. <laughs> uh, congratulations on uh, being the inaugural H.O. Hartley Chair. Th thank you. Uh, and thank uh, Urson and Bill and for their generous contributions to make this possible. Um, I was not a Hartley student, so I don't know uh, Ho as well as uh, uh, Bill and Urson and uh, Jim and uh, John Rao, but um, I did have several interactions with uh, Dr. Hartley, um, all positive interactions, and some of the stories that were told uh, I can remember quite well. Um, I was a student there starting in 1967, and how did I get to Texas A&M? Well, Rudy Freund had uh, moved from um, VPI to Texas A&M, and he was my advisor at the VPI when I got my master's degree. And I was looking for a place where I could go and finish in a reasonably short period of time. And uh, he told me that uh, H.O. Hartley from uh, Iowa was coming down there to uh, be, be the uh, director of the Institute of Statistics. And I um, looked him up and I said, well, this looks really, really interesting and uh, very encouraging. So. I applied for a National Science Foundation fellowship and was able to get one. Uh, that was very nice. It paid my, my salary for two years, actually, while I was a student. That's a pretty nice award. And, um, and, and uh, I got to know uh, Dr. Hartley reasonably well. Um, some of the stories that were told about him are absolutely true. I can remember him at the seminars taking a little snooze and then asking the most insightful question that you could possibly ask at the end of the uh, seminar. I, I actually learned that trick. I try it out myself. It doesn't work so well for me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at, at any rate, I, um, I worked with uh, Ron Hocking and I uh, got my degree in 1971, one year after um, uh, that guy, uh, Mattis, that Mattis fellow. And, um, and um, I can, um, also remember Ho coming to many meetings and uh, the, getting up to the stage to talk and the, of course asking, uh, can, can you see me? Uh, and that was, a, he did that all the time. And I uh, got a big roar all the time that he did that. Um, and um, I was uh, fortunate enough to um, be there when Egon Pearson visited and uh, with the uh, Volume two of the uh, biometric, uh, the Pearson Hartley tables from uh, biometric tables. And uh, lo and behold, I was called into uh, Dr. Hartley's office and I, I had no idea what he was uh, going to do uh, with me at that time. And he said, you know, I'd like you to uh, generate one of the tables here that we've got for the biometric tables. And so I said, uh, well, <laughs> I'm not the greatest uh, computer guy in the world, but uh, I'll, I'll sure give it a try. And so, uh, lo and behold, I uh, learned a little computing and so with a little help from some of the other students and uh, generated these tables. And, uh, and I have a copy of them also. Uh, I don't have them with me because I'm home and they're in my office and they won't let me go to my office. So, um, but I did want to say 
I wanted to show you, uh, if you put my picture up here, uh, I'll show you something. Can you put my picture up here? Um, can, yep, uh, we, Brownie, I have your picture, can you? We can see you. You can, can see, see me? Yes. All right, so, so I have a Texas A&M tie on today. I didn't see anybody else with anything It's the Texas A&M. What's wrong <laughs> with you guys, huh? <laughs> so, um, so um, I, ha I also have a shirt, but the problem is the shirt doesn't fit me anymore because uh, this uh, global epidemic has uh, put on a few pounds for me because I eat a lot at home when I'm working at home. And so uh, and I, I drink a little bit too much of also, but uh, we won't talk about that. So um, at, at any rate, it was a great pleasure. And, uh, and, the, and the contrast between Egon, uh, six foot five and Ho about five feet was just amazing. I've always... Working when I was there, and so um, I'm, I'm, I think this is a great tribute to uh, A and M. I want to thank uh, everybody for um, um, my success in, in life as a statistician, in large part due to my training at Texas A and M, which was wonderful, with Rao and Hartley and Hawking and Smith and Flash. I'll always remember your courses, babe. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad to add a little uh, to, to the story of Ho, uh, great man, uh, wonderful, wonderful individual, kind, considerate, and brilliant. Uh, there's no question about that. And uh, I'm glad his daughter is here to uh, reflect on um, personal things about, about dad. So uh, thank you very much for asking me to say a few words, and uh, I'd love to do it. So thank you. Thank you, Mike, very much. I see that Jan is online from Canada. Jan, can you hear us? Yes. C can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you put the slides later on? Yes, uh, slides okay. are the process of... Oh, okay, all right. So I just talk. No, no, no. Uh, they are going to be shared in a second. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. All right. Are they visible? Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to congratulate Brani for, uh, for, the, for taking charge of the endowed chair for Hartley. This means a lot. And also for inviting me because Hartley was my guru. In, you know, in, a, in Indian tradition, guru means teacher. And in Sanskrit, regarded as the almighty God. Uh, so unfortunately, these days it's not so much true that students regard the teacher as a guru. Anyway, uh, I have a lot to say, but you know, given that I got only 10 minutes plus epsilon, epsilon I hope could be stretched to two, three minutes. Uh, <laughs> so I'll start, you know, I got a long association with Hartley goes back to 1958. So let me, let me uh, at Iowa State University when Hartley was there. Uh, I was a research scholar in India during 56, 58 at a place called the Forest Research Institute. I was doing some um, uh, work on sur sample surveys related to forest research. And my supervisor was Dr. K.R. Nair. He is well known for his joint work with R.C. Bose on partially balanced incomplete block designs, 1937 paper. He was same age as Hartley, I think. But he went to uh, London to get a PhD after writing the path-breaking paper on PBIB design. So he was a student of Hartley in London. I'll tell you one joke Hartley used to say. Uh, he would describe a thesis problem slowly and nicely as Hartley always does. And uh, Nair would nod his head. You know, this Indians do that. So Hartley thought he didn't understand. So he would repeat it again. And Nair would nod, uh, nod his head again. So finally he understood that he knew it right in the first. And you, many of you may not know that the famous George Box was also Hartley's student. And there is another famous person, H.A. David, 
who was uh, at Iowa State for many years as the uh, uh, chair of the department, were also Hartley students. And of course, he had many other uh, famous students. Next slide, please. So what happened, uh, I was doing my PhD, two-year scholarship, and uh, Nair encouraged me to go to Iowa State because Hartley was his uh, guru, to do my PhD under Hartley. And I had an intense interest in survey sampling that time. And you see, Hartley was not in survey sampling uh, before 1954. He was, you know, he's a jack of all trades. But he started working on survey sampling and uh, as Brani mentioned, the Hartley Ross estimate, or ratio estimate, and all that. So I arrived in Iowa State uh, sort of in the fall, uh, end of October, and I went to the office to search for Hartley. So there, this little man came. Uh, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, a huge stature, you know, big guy. So he came to me and said, can I help you? I said, no, I'm looking for Hartley. <laughs> So that was, he said, no, I am hardly, oh, I was just about ready to freeze, you know. So he knew, uh, so he, I, I had a, established a quick contact with him and he, he could un, figure out that I was quite interested in survey sampling and also knew quite a bit because two years in uh, India, all the time looking at journals and studying and so on. I wrote even four or five papers uh, while in India. So he asked me immediately, I think in two, two months after I arrived, uh, to study the theory of randomized PPS systematic sampling. This is a hard one to do and quite challenging. And we, this is part of my PhD thesis. Uh, it led to a paper in the uh, uh, Annals of Mathematical Statistics in 1962. It's also sometimes called Hartley Raw Method. And it's been used in uh, many surveys, in, for instance, in Canada. Uh, labor force survey has been used since 1973. Then I finished my PhD in 1961. And I was, a, you know, it's unusual in Iowa State to appoint their own student on the faculty, but somehow they decided to appoint me. So I joined ISU as assistant professor in 1961 and continued my joint work with Hartley for two years. I think that was one of the most productive period in my life. Uh, and this led to one paper in, uh, which uh, Brownlee mentioned, the Raw Hartley Cochrane in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, Series B. I, you know, it's something for a young guy to have a paper with two giants, Hartley and Cochrane. It's interesting. But then, you know, we both left ISU in 1963 uh, for different reasons. Hartley took uh, directorship at, uh, at Texas A&M. I had to go back to India uh, for strong family reasons, and I even resigned my job, tenure position, I just resigned and went off. So unfortunately, things didn't work out in India. I came back to USA, and I was in Dallas at a research institute. Hartley found out that I was there, and he immediately dragged me to Texas A&M. So I joined Texas A&M as an associate professor in 1965, and left on leave for India, Again, due to family problems, I had to go back to India, uh, joined the Indian Statistical Institute as a visiting professor. And during that period, I found out that Canada suited because I could go home four months a year and get paid. So I wrote to Hartley that, okay, I'll tell you later on. So I want to say, say this important thing. My son, Sunil Rao, who is in attendance there, was born in April 1967 in Bryan, Texas. So he's really Texan, okay? Dr. Hartley and Mrs. Hartley, as a, some of you have already pointed out, they treated us like you know their own children or grandchildren. And Hartley and Mrs. Hartley insisted on performing name-giving ceremony according to Hindu tradition in their house. Jennifer would know this, remember that. Sunil was a two-month-old kid. Now Sunil is now the director of biostatistics at the University of Miami. Next, please. Now, I'll briefly mention uh, a few, uh, few selected works I did with Hartley Joint Work. And I would say the two include, the, the work I did include two landmark papers. One is called the Maximum Likelihood Estimation Under Linear Mixed Models, Biometrica 67. And the other one is the New Estimation Theory for Sample Service, uh, 
uh, Biometrica 1968. So let me mention a little bit about those two uh, papers. Next, please. Next slide, yeah. The, this summarizes nicely what is in that Biometrica 67 paper. Uh, Shaw and Cyril, you know, it's, a, uh, it's unfortunate. I, uh, he, he came to Texas A&M as a, a visiting professor for a year, just about, just before, just after I left to India. So I didn't have a chance to uh, interact with him. But he did help my, one of my PhD students uh, with his thesis uh, uh, completion. So, he, you know, he wrote a famous book on variance components. And incidentally, Shail is a pretty tough guy. If he doesn't like something, he tells you right away, it's no good. So he, but he, did, he was nice to us. This is what he wrote. The landmark paper for ML estimation in general is around 1967. Wherein a methodology is developed for a wide class of models, all mixed and random models, with, the, with or without covariates, balanced or unbalanced data. Undoubtedly, it was the matrix specification of a mixed model, Hartley and Rao use, that was instrumental to their deriving ML equations for the general case. Unfortunately, you know, people don't mention this original papers. They always go and look at some recent review and give credit to the, that person, which I think is unfortunate. One should go back to the original source and you can add the review paper uh, later on. Next page. And I remember when we were working on this, you know, Hartley was already done work on this missing data, so-called, now called EM algorithm. So we, uh, so naturally he thought of this, because the random effect is like missing. So he, he said, John, let's try the EM algorithm. So I read his paper and we, we had a section five in the paper on the EM algorithm. But what happened is those days the computers were very slow. So the convergence was slow. And you know, Hartley is a restless man. So no, no, John, this is not good. We'll go into steepest descent because he knew so much about numerical optimization methods. And I was telling him, you know, Dr. Hartley, you know, incidentally, I never called him Ho. This is my Indian tradition. You never call your major professor by first name. Anyway, I told him, you know, you know we should try some scoring method. He didn't, he didn't like it. But later on, what I suggested, I had a, a master's student. He worked on that. And the, late, later on, Bill Hammerley was visiting uh, Texas A&M. He wrote a joint paper with Hartley and the scoring method called the W transformation. Anyway, the EM algorithm was proposed in the 1967 paper, but not pursued further due to slow computing those days. The highly cited EM algorithm paper by DLR, Dempster, Laird, and Rubin, in fact says, we note that the iterative algorithm by Hartley and Rao for the mixed model is essentially the EM algorithm. So they did acknowledge it. And in fact, R. Dempster wrote to me before his paper was published, sent a uh, draft of his paper asking for comments. So I fully agree with uh, Brony that we need a, a entry on Hartley's contribution to EM algorithm. The second topic is those days there was a lot of debate going on on foundations of uh, th sampling theory, so-called label controversy. I don't have time to go into that. So we, uh, Hartley and I, you know, I used to tell Hartley what is going on because he never used to read. And then uh, many times you see, in a one day he would have 20 different ideas. He would, he would ask me, John, what about it? 18 of them are already done, but two of them not done, <laughs> you know? So incredible man, he, the way he would think about problems constantly. So anyway, so we thought, you know, what, what's the problem with these labels? Because it leads to a, a likelihood function, which is non in That means it provides no information on the non-sample units. So we developed a new estimation theory. We called it scale load likelihood approach. What you have to do, you have to make the likelihood informative by suppressing some aspects of the data. For example, you're drawing a simple random sample you suppress the labels, then it leads to a multi-dimensional hypergeometric distribution, what you call non-parametric likelihood. So we developed that and the Biometrica paper uh, published that. And there's another paper we wrote in a, in a book because the, the parameters of the multi hypergeometric are, are integers. So Hartley, you know, he's a, he's a tremendous intuition and the ability to do numerical work 
He developed the integer programming method. It's not used in the survey context, but I heard the computer scientists are using it extensively uh, that method there. Next, play, next slide. Now, scale load uh, was rediscovered for the IID case by Art Oven 20 years later on, and he called it empirical likelihood. Believe it or not, it is an explosive area now. I don't know, thousands of papers are published on uh, EL. And I wrote to Art that I said, listen, this is, this is a special case of what I did with uh, Ho. And he was very kind. He, he, he mentioned it in his book. The only thing is EM algorithm, the EL method went beyond and looked at confidence intervals. And then, you know, survey samplers are mostly interested in estimation, variance estimation. One of the important contributions there is how to do inference when you got constraints. That is, you know the population mean of a concomitant variable. That's the first paper which addressed that and Art Oven acknowledges that. Okay, given my time is running out, I will mention one more topic. <laughs> this, these days, the big thing is data integration. You know, big data, social media data go, is going crazy in survey sampling now. I'm sure in uh, other areas also. <clears throat> what is interesting is this so-called data integration idea has gone back to Hartley in 1962 <clears throat> when we were both in Iowa State. You know, he used to call uh, his PhD students and uh, his uh, collaborators in a classroom. We will discuss, you will write in the blackboard what his ideas are. And what he did, how do you integrate two frames? Both could be incomplete or one of them complete, one of them incomplete. So in the, in the second case where one is complete, like you ask, are you in the list frame, which is incomplete? If yes, you screen it out and replace it by the list frame uh, estimate. So this is the idea now, you get a big data, which is incomplete, and you have a probability sample from a complete frame. I put them together and that is an important contribution. I mentioned this in my uh, 2020 paper. Okay, now let me make a few more comments. Uh, some people talked about Hartley attending seminars, I, I remember very well. Uh, he, he would doze off while people are talking, but the speaker is talking. So when uh, the talk is finished, he would raise his hand, you can hardly see. He would say, uh, let me first clarify what the speaker is saying. Believe it or not, in three minutes, we knew what exactly the speaker is saying. And speaker would not, yes, yes, that's what I mean. It's an incredible thing. And, you know, the last paper I wrote with Hartley was 1977. Uh, one thing I must say, when I left Texas A&M in 68 and didn't come, go back, uh, Hartley was quite taken back. He didn't expect it. But we still continued research. But Mrs. Hartley was quite angry with me. For uh, 15 years, she didn't talk to me. Finally, there was a conference in Ottawa when we made amends and I explained to her my problem. Uh, so he's the greatest, you know, as far as my, I'm concerned, he was my real guru. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have special guest. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Dr. Hartley's daughter, would like to say something. Jennifer, are you still with us? me uh, okay. yes okay you can hear me mm -hmm. I'm I'm playing my father's game you can hear me and see me I don't know <laughs> yes you can it is yes yes okay yes. okay yes. well um, I'm I'm the, the last person to speak and so I must apologize if I'm saying some things yes. that ha have been said but I'm saying them as uh, HO's daughter, yes. I would like to say a few words about him as I knew him. And for me, strong features of his personality was his amazing ability to adapt to changing circumstances in his life. And one could say he began to use this strength 
One is a young doctoral graduate in Berlin University, today Humboldt University. He realized that his Jewish lineage would prevent him from living a normal life in Nazi Germany. So at the age of 22, his German-British nationality permitted him to immigrate to Britain, where he learned to adapt himself to a new society and a new language. He was successful in his career. His high quality research earned him a second doctorate at the University of Cambridge in 1940. It was in Britain that he replaced the world of theoretical pure mathematics with applied mathematics and statistics. Nice. But post-war Britain was not easy for young scientists interested in advancing their career. And so it was in 1953 that my father accepted an invitation by Iowa State University to spend a year as visiting professor. And that year would become a 10 year stay. <laughs> Once again, he used his ability to adapt to new circumstances. And this time it was for the American way of life. Ames, Iowa was a very friendly community, good place to bring up his two children, Jennifer and Michael. Though Grace, his ever supporting wife, found the long winters of snow quite a trial at times. And so perhaps the cold and the snow led my father to accept an offer coming from the sunny south. Yes, in 1963, he began once again a new life, and this time in the state of Texas. He adapted himself to the challenging new role of building an institute of statistics. And as his, a sign of his adoption to the Texas way of life, he, came, he became the proud owner of a ranch, as we have heard, a necessary symbol for anybody proclaiming to be a real Texan. My father had other personal qualities and many personal qualities. You have talked about many of them. Perhaps, for, perhaps his most important quality was his passion for mathematics and later the world of statistics, which he saw as a magnificent tool for clarifying abstract notions and transforming them into pr practical, useful solutions. Statistics was always a never ending challenge for my father's inquisitive mind. He was an excellent pedagogue as you have said. He loved teaching and he loved his students. They were his children. He never became angry with those who were not rapid to, to produce results. He felt that he had a duty to get them through to their PhD. And if students were depressed over their work, my father was always ready to give them, as it has been said, a pep talk. Very often such talks took place on Saturday morning over coffee in my father's home office. He wished to transmit what he knew to others and he would become quite upset with students who were only interested in the mark they would obtain for a course. The question, Professor Hartley, will this part of your lecture be on the next exam? Would leave him speechless was liked by everyone. He had no enemies. He had a very kind nature and he was always interested in people. And this may explain why he and my mother were extremely hospitable, regularly organizing social events at our home for visiting academics, faculty members, and students. And my father had a wonderful sense of humor, often at his own expense, and he loved telling stories. As you know, and has been said, he was very small in stature and he would often talk about himself as being small. And we have heard about his, uh, what he would do very frequently when he would start a, a lecture or a presentation asking if he, if he could be seen and could be heard. And in the same vein, when he was in, in Texas A&M at an official dinner, he was awarded on one occasion, a genuine Western hat. And he was asked, Ho, how do you think you will look in this new hat? And he replied, 
I don't think I will be looking at all. So to conclude, our family is very touched that my father's spirit lives on. My father would be very proud to see that the domain that he loved is being pursued by others and that the world of statistics will continue to play a major role in the world to come. Thank you very much. Jennifer, that was very nice. Thank you for, for, for your words. So uh, we came to conclusion to, to our tribute, to our meeting. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody, starting with the uh, College of Science at Texas A&M with the school, uh, uh, and to uh, participants, uh, speakers, and uh, we should uh, meet uh, maybe next year or in a couple of years and see where, what we did. And I would be back to all of you for, to write down about these small anecdotes, to these small sketches, to these small uh, things to, to stay, and also to, to get uh, an idea of what can be put also in, in Wikipedia to make this uh, legacy to this great man uh, even more prominent. So thank you all. Um, Shay, uh, so you? Yes, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. And I know that Dr. Hartley and his wife would be greatly touched to see his legacy live on. Um, we are honored to put on such a celebration. Again, we're sad that it couldn't be in person, but we know that this is the way it has to be. So we're just thankful that you all can make it today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. It's good to hear from you again. Enjoyed that time with you when we were in Paris. Oh, yeah. Nice to see you, Bill. Pat is here, too, by the way. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> hey, Jennifer. Hello. Hello. Hi, Jennifer. This is John Rao. Yes, I can see you. I can see you.